And then where we see impacts, we can then look for the actual mechanism of toxicity. Why did it cause that toxic impact? Um, and then try and design around that. So all of this data that we're collecting on the nanomaterial properties and on the biological impacts is now going into this informatics database that we have at Oregon State that, that I run now. Um, and in there is where we're trying to, to, to tease apart structure property relationships. Okay, and this is kind of the theory behind the, the nanomaterial biological interactions knowledge bases is to take you know, our data that's, that's being synthesized within Oregon and within our, our research group here um, and basically put it in bins, okay? Um, curate data from other people's databases, the National Toxicology Program, um, the National Cancer Institute has a, a nice data set. Um, and so we're, we're taking these other people's data sets and trying to, to build some sort of comprehensive knowledge of the, the, the biological impact. And on the other side, trying to do the same thing for the nanoparticles themselves. Um, University of Massachusetts probably has the best um, nano manufacturing database um, anywhere. And so we're using their knowledge to fill in on you know, what happens with the synthesis processes and what does that mean for the nanoparticle properties themselves. So we can start linking everything along the way. Um, but the ultimate goal here is to get at this holy grail which properties do we need to tweak? That's what we need to know. Okay, so here are just a couple of um, overarching design rules that we have um, deciphered from the data sets that we have in there currently. So we have tested and have information on over 200 different nanomaterials, um, and, and these are distinct nanomaterials, so they're different, you know, each one is, is different. Um, of these, the vast majority of them have not been toxic. Okay, so the, okay, that's good. That's really good. Um, and only a few that we've tested have been toxic at you know relevant concentrations, at environmentally relevant concentrations that you would be exposed to, unless you're a worker in one of these factories. Um, so for um, and I just want to point out some of the design rules that we've learned for a couple of different types of nanomaterials. So dendromers are um, basically just branched polymers. So you can think of them as a snowflake of branched polymer. Um, and the, the um, test, or the series that I was testing was a series that they were developing for cancer treatment for, as a drug delivery device to deliver cancer therapeutics to cancer cells. Um, so of these 40 dendromers that we tested, six of them had some toxic potential. And um, it was very good, and the industry appreciated hearing this information. But when we could go back and say, those ones that were toxic had some things in common, that's even more important, okay? So instead of just telling the industry, well, these ones were bad, don't go with these ones, we can actually tell them what particular feature of them made them bad so they can avoid that in their other formulations. Okay, so if they had this particular surface group um, at, on the outside of the dendromer, um, we saw that they were toxic. Three of the 40 dendromers had a proprietary core, which they hadn't um, released their, their business information on, um, but it was proprietary because it was supposed to increase the thermal stability of this particular polymer. However, it also resulted in acute toxicity. And so that was important for them to know as well, that that, you know, it has increased thermal stability, which might be good for some applications, but probably not for drug delivery since it was um, quite toxic. I've tested um, a series of viral capsids um, from two different um, virus strains, um, and they're using these actually for drug delivery and for diagnostics. Um, of those, only one of them was really suspect, but it was only at really high concentrations, and it was one that had a surface group on it um, that's polyethylene glycol, which basically allows it to float around in your bloodstream a lot longer than the other ones would be there. And so we kind of um, figured that that might be why um, that one was suspect. But really, it was only at extraordinarily high concentrations. Um, of 11 different metal oxides that I've tested, um, and these can be used for various applications depending on what, what you're looking at, um, the toxicity of these materials appeared to be related to one of two things. One was the shape. So you can see here, this is titanium dioxide. And you can see it, it looks kind of 
um, soft, okay? It, there's no sharp edges on it, okay? This one here is samarium oxide, and you can see these little protruding, like, prickly structures. All of the metal oxides that I tested that were toxic had these prickly structures coming off of them. And so if you think about this from a cell's point of view, if you have a particle coming towards you, and a lot of cells will take up particles of a particular size because that's what they do. If you engulf this particle and it's soft and squishy like the titanium dioxide, you can take it up and process it, okay? But if it's pokey, you may get a membrane rupture, okay? And so it may kill the cell just by having that little prosthetic off of it. Um, the other reason, or the, the other one that was quite toxic was the erbium oxide that I showed you earlier. Okay, so this is, in the scanning electron microscope, it's going to go through like this, and it refreshes every time. So this is literally when we started hitting the electron beam. You can see when particles come out, they're going to be roughly this size. And that was the primary particle size. That was the size that the particles were, but you can see them. They're getting all excited, they start moving away from each other, and then what happens is that they lose this energy input and they start reagglomerating and forming back into um, a, a solid um, blob. Is this, where you change them? is this where you change them at? You introduce something to make it turn into something else? Well, this, this is in response to an electron beam right, that's right. hitting the surface of it that we basically just use to look at the surface features of okay. these materials. But it excited it so much. And the guys, this, I did this down at the, the Center for um, Advanced Materials Characterization at University of Oregon. And the, the guy that runs the scanning electron microscope um, was so excited. We kept, we kept moving it to a new spot and doing it. Will he do it again? And we'd move it to a new spot because he'd never seen anything like this before. So, so basically, <laughs> and neither had I. It was very exciting. You're just changing the shape and size of this particle, right? Yeah, so what they're doing basically, so we're not changing the shape or size of the particle. We're changing the, sh the way that it's interacting with the other particles around it. So where it's forming these is a whole group of particles that have now kind of melded back together. If you add a lot of energy, is it the same base material or no? Yeah, yeah. So this is just pure erbium oxide. Okay. So, but you can, I mean, if you think about this and what potential applications you have for that, I mean, it's just mind blowing. Okay, so I will end here and I would be happy to, to answer any questions that you might have. <laughs>